Awesome. I want to show you firstly a video of some of the work that we're doing at the moment. Um, in particular, bit, the way we're packaging this and how we talk about how we're measuring it um, at the end. This has become um, the new normal for us is how we very quickly speak about the outputs, the impact it's had on a brand and the business outcomes in all of our casework. Uh, this work is out of Thailand. It's for a brand called Strepsils. Um, from Wreck at Ben Kieser. This is the kind of work we would not have been doing two or three years ago in the Thailand market, which is a much more traditional PR market historically. Um, so I'm very pleased to see this kind of work um, that we've moved to. And as Stuart mentioned yesterday, you know, this is a great example of the new world of PR for us, being in a PR agency role. So let me show the case. For decades, Strepsils has been Thailand's medicated lozenge of choice. But much of today's younger consumers are concerned about over-medicating. And while Strepsils offers non-medicated choices, the brand wasn't top of mind in this category. Strepsils was struggling against its own legacy with its future consumers. We needed to change people's perception and found our magic pill through insight into the heart of human communications. We discovered that communications can be influenced by how you sound. In other words, how you say it is more important than what you say. We used this insight to develop a Voice for Success creative idea. We positioned Strepsils as the top brand for voice preparation maintenance and performance. Anyone who wanted to use their voice to make a good impression would think of Strepsils. In effect, we carved out a relevant new territory that Strepsils could credibly own. We used popular singers, voice actors and news reporters as our brand ambassadors, including a famous R&B singer who was also an expert in the Alexander technique of voice training. We made people aware that Strepsils also come in non-medicated versions that can be taken regularly. The Voice for Success platform also helped us speak to a younger audience. This was done through roadshows featuring hit pop bands. We also held voice workshops at 10 universities in Bangkok, which let us engage students who were eager to make their mark on the world. Recruitment took place on Strepsil's dedicated website and social media helped create a dialogue with the public. The results of our Voice for Success campaign speak for themselves. Market share for non-medicated Strepsils surpassed our target, while our leading competitor lost market share. Our medicated lozenges also earned market share, proving that our campaign had a positive impact on our existing loyal customers as well. And brand tracking showed incredible gains versus our nearest competitor. On social media, we got more than 135 million impressions. Weekly reach on our Facebook posts grew from 90,000 to 340,000. And monthly visits to the LiveWell website rose from 2,000 to 58,000. The PR campaign was so successful that the brand will roll it out in four of their largest Asian markets. And, most importantly, Strepsils has now found a voice that resonates with consumers. We love working with a client like this, a client who says up front, not only are we going to be measuring all of the output work that we do, but here's Millwood Brown, our brand tracking agency. Let's talk to them and make sure we have the timing of our brand health studies pre and post the campaign. So we're building that into the way we measure. And we'll share with you all of the business results so we can package up a great view of the output we've created, the impact it's had on the brand and the business outcomes for the case. This is becoming for us at Ogilvy standard way of how we approach the work up front, how it's going to be measured, what business goals are we addressing and how we package it at the end for clients to take back internally to their organisation. Um, 
As I was preparing for this workshop, I met up with Carly in Hong Kong uh, a week ago, and um, she sat out and shared with me over a glass of wine, I hope you don't mind me saying, that um, she said, I worry about what would have happened to Amec if the PR and research agencies had not joined a few years ago and really pushed the measurement agenda along. And I said back to her, actually, I worry about what will happen to us if we don't have new kinds of comms agencies join us as well, particularly digital agencies or a Google would be a great partner here to see at a meeting in a couple of years, because that's where I think we're headed on measurement. And certainly hearing the great workshop this morning um, from the three great CEOs who shared their view on data and where data is going to impact how we're measuring, I think we do need to be talking to different kinds of partners for better integrated measurement in the future. Um, there's a couple of things I want to set up that my panel are then going to talk about their personal experiences on. The first is whether you're going to be a leader or a follower in integrated comms measurement. They're very different strategies and they require obviously different levels of investment. Um, one skill is around learning to read where your clients are on this journey. For us, we look out, we look out for things like seeing changes in clients' own internal organisation structure that might precipitate changes in how they are going to integrate marketing comms. And Meredith is going to share with you a great journey that she's just been through in her own organisation on that. Um, we also look at, if we're being briefed on a project, what we ask now more and more our clients, what other kinds of agencies are you briefing? Because that gives us some insight into how are they looking to different kinds of skill sets to answer this business problem. I worked in Myanmar last year, in Burma, some of you know it as, for six months. Um, we received one brief um, from a, a major automobile company and uh, we asked who else they were briefing and they said an events company was one of the other kinds of companies they were briefing alongside a PR company and a digital marketing company. So they weren't even putting out the brief to three different PR agencies. They were actually putting it to wildly different types of agencies to see the approach that they would come up with. Um, I'm also very familiar with walking into briefs with blended teams. Heather from Unilever, is, uh, know your organisation is an expert at doing that, is to bring together all the different specialists at a briefing stage, set up objectives together and how we're going to measure that and combine it right from the start. So spotting those signs, how you lead it, and lots of the things that require a lot of investment and commitment, um, if you are going to be a leader in this space, are things like the thought leadership around integrated comms. So investing in that, profiling that. The way we package our work, what you just saw in that Strepsils example, is a new case study approach I'm teaching all of our teams across Asia Pacific around how to approach and package up the work from an integrated mindset. Um, right through to identifying the kinds of client list that you'd like to be working with if you're an agency side or if you're a client, identifying the kinds of agencies you want to be working who are thinking like this and demonstrating that through their thought leadership. And of course, membership of AMIC. Barry didn't pay me to put that on the end. <laughs> but it is for us one of the visible signs that we're very committed to effectiveness measurement and the way that is developing. So me being here, Stuart being here yesterday as our global CEO is a very visible part of ensuring that Ogilvy is actively involved in, engaged in discussion with the measurement industry as we work towards more integrated communications measurement. There are two other implications that we are going to speak to today, um, and my team, Lilia and um, Carly in particular, have a lot of experience around the talent implications of integrated comms measurement. Um, that slide is simply meant to show a, a bunch of wildly different people coming together now in our organisation. Ogilvy has historically been, Ogilvy PR anyway, has historically been a company of great writers, former journalists and media people. We are now trying to bring in very different kinds of talent into the organisation. And some of them are not an easy fit at first. And I would say that bringing in people like content specialists, data specialists, um, they often struggle in the first three to six months to find their place, how to be effective, how to communicate in our culture. And one of the things we're realising is how do we nurture and protect these new skill sets as they come in and give them the space to impact and change our culture um, quite significantly. Otherwise, we do set ourselves up for failure. You know, as John was mentioning this morning, and I think Walter also mentioned, bringing in people like data scientists are an expensive and difficult hire and will move on quickly if they feel their skills are not respected or valued in an organisation. So how we protect that is a very important and new part of our talent strategy. 
And then the last of these is the product implications. What kinds of measurement products, what kinds of um, products as an agency are you going to be offering for integrated comms? And again, I'm going to hand over to some of my great team to speak to their experiences in these areas. But just to set that up, um, is we're talking about the leading versus following, the different stages on the journey. Carly is newer, her organisation is newer on that journey. Lily is kind of halfway through and Meredith and Heather are obviously well along that journey. So we've organised ourselves along that journey in how we will speak about it today as well. So without further ado, let me hand over to, to our gold sponsor for the day, Talkwalker, thank you. And Carly, thanks very much. Hi everybody, uh, welcome. I'm so excited to be on this panel today and so excited to be here. My name's Carly Sackis, I'm from Icentia and I've approached our topic today from two, two approaches. I'm giving you a view from Australia and New Zealand, but I also wanted to give the view of a traditional measurement and evaluation company, and I can see a few around here, um, how we're going because we're not leading this and it's a, we have huge challenges ahead of us. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that perspective today. So integration has been a wider theme that has been around our business for a long time. We've seen integration on many levels. Obviously a few years ago, social and traditional had to be integrated into our reporting. We had to absolutely re-engineer our methodology so that we could report seamlessly to our clients. We had to get the most out of social measurement and keep our strength in traditional measurement. We've seen, and the biggest theme of yesterday is that the synergy that we need between the global and the local and the regional. We're seeing we need to integrate on multi-market reports. We need to integrate our language skills. We need to present seamless analysis. As we move more towards reporting on outcomes, what we're all striving to do, we've also had to work out ways to integrate different data sets. For the measurement companies here, we've really only looked at media coverage, content analysis of media coverage. Now we have to look at sales data, revenue, NPS, customer satisfaction. This is a massive learning curve for our business. And finally, the, the topic of today, the integration between marketing and communications. So marketing and social have been influencing our market and our clients for a very long time. But in Australia and New Zealand, it's an influence. I don't see a truly integrated world right now. Part of the most notable thing I've worked out about this influence, what I can see on the ground, is that our reports have changed. When I worked for Jim <laughs> five years ago, we would take great pride in giving our clients war and peace, right? The value was in how much you could write. You would find the insight, you would tease it out, you would actually, we hired writers, we hired journalists, communications graduates, because the most important skill you needed was to write. Now I look at our reports. They're not 45 pages, they're a one page dashboard and there's about four words on them. Right? That has serious implications for how we recruit and how we train and for our clients. The reason why I sent here travels 27 hours to get to AMEC every year <laughs> is because it puts our finger on the pulse of what is happening in Russia, what is happening in the US, what is happening throughout Europe. And without these types of conferences, we would be out of touch. So from Icentia's standpoint, we can see that the integrated comms world is a strong theme. It's taken hold in Europe, China, US. I'm going to admit it. Things take time to reach us down under, all right? We're a bit behind here. <laughs> but what that gives me and what that gives Icentia is a window of opportunity. The question then becomes, how do we future-proof our business? We know it's coming. We've heard from our AMAC friends. We've heard from Marion. We know that it's coming. How can we future-proof? How can we be stronger in three years' time? We've started this journey. Restructuring our teams is the first step. Do we have the right people in the right roles? When we have them there, do they know how to speak to our clients? Do they have the language of marketing? Sometimes it gets down to, do they look right? Do they have the right haircut or wear the right clothes? Because it's a very different agency space we're moving into. We're also looking at client mapping to work out and navigate the extent of integration 
one by one with our clients. And this is a project we're starting in late June with all of our account directors and really actually mapping out the integration in every client of ours. And I think that that will help. We're definitely realigning our services or starting on this journey. So the story is now told in, it's not told in words. We need to get more sophisticated with data visualization because that's how we're going to be telling the story. As John mentioned this morning, we have recruited a data scientist to help us with this because we did not have the skills within our teams. Part of the measurement company challenge, and you mentioned this, Marion, is that we don't have access to business results. A lot of, that's one of the major problems about reporting on outcomes and business results is that the clients are sometimes very reluctant to share that data. Sometimes they actually don't have it within that organisation. So one pilot project that my team are working on is to use Icentia's data to get familiar with our own marketing team data. So we're sharing, we're looking at our MPS, we're looking at all these sorts of different data sets to really get familiar and to train up within the safety zone internally. We're also fo focusing a lot more on getting into owned and paid data. So that's a critical step we needed to make and that's coming through our monitoring portal now. While we, haven't, while we have been behind and we haven't had all of the expertise to win in the integrated comms world, one thing has really, really helped us and that's collaboration. We've really, we saw that we didn't have all the expertise and we set out to frame ourselves as the preferred partner in Asia Pacific. So we want to be the best person to work with. We want to be the best analyst to work with. So that has really opened the door to getting familiar and really building our skills in this space. We have, it's given us global opportunities. So in Australia and New Zealand, we don't get to be the lead on global tenders, but we can contribute and we can play a part in that to learn more about that. We also, it, collaborating has also meant that we can be part of much larger projects, the national significant projects, the, the work that we all really, really love doing, collaborating with three or four other businesses, an advertising company, a market research company, a social media company, that's actually allowed us to see a bigger world and a much more interesting world. Thank you. I'm pass on to, do you want me to pass it back to you? Thank you, Lilia. Oh, sorry. Sure. It was not on purpose. <laughs> so, um, let me do that. My name is Lilia, and uh, I represent a company which is called PR News. It's a media monitoring, media analysis, and, media, and now PR measurement company. So we really went through all these steps, starting just like a media monitoring company. And um, I would like uh, the things that I would like to share to you with you today will be uh, first of all really a, some landscape of the region because probably not all of you know about Russia because we are, we are a very big country with all the specialities that we can have. And uh, then I will go through the client's landscape, as uh, Marianne already mentioned, because it's really also very interesting. And then our experience on integrated communications measurement. And uh, I will start with that picture to show the speciality of the country that we have. I think all of you know that it's babushka, yes, which means an old woman. So I can call it my grandmother a babushka too, but I can call any other woman at this age babushka. Why I decided to pick up this picture to show you. The, uh, the main problem for digitalization, this long, long word, and is the same in Russia, also a very long one, and uh, we even call it internetization. And uh, the, uh, the main problem was with the technology. Really, the internet penetration was pretty low when we started with digital. It was really a matter of issue whether to go for digital or not, even for the big international companies, because the audience were not there. And for the last two and three years, we see this shift that the uh, internet penetration among uh, people um, elder than 55 is growing and growing. And the main reason for that is tablets. Tablets, PC, so it's much easier for them to use internet through the tablet than to the normal personal computer PC. So that was a main trend that really pushed uh, people to use uh, more and more g digital instruments in their marketing strategy. And, uh, but the next uh, challenge that they were facing, especially international companies coming to the Russian market, was the local social networks that we have. We have our own version of Facebook, which is called Kontakti. We have our own version of Classmates, which is called Adnaklasniki. And we have, uh, Twitter is 
absolutely not popular. So when, for example, I was asked, Lily, give your login for Twitter, and I was like, I need to check it first, really, because I'm not using it. And uh, f Facebook is somehow like a professional network. So for example, if you're my Facebook friends with me on Facebook, you will see, you will not see personal information of me very, 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 like, uh, just one or two times per year, I let myself to put it. And, uh, uh, and the other stuff, and I will go for that, blog platforms are very popular still. So for example, we are using livejournal.com. We are having our own blog platforms like blog.mail.ru. And, uh, we, and the other stuff, which is forums, we are using it a lot, a lot, and a lot. So you can find forum for everything, for any region, for any hobby that you have. I always said I was, um, uh, it happened with me like five years ago, I, was, I, I like uh, jigsaw puzzles, it's my hobby. I, I do this all the time, now not very often because of the work, but uh, I had a very good collection. So I just put these uh, jigsaw puzzles and I found a great forum for that, even for jigsaw puzzles, just imagine. So um, what we want, but still at the same time, we have this uh, television and radio, television I would say, as the main channel. The main national television channels, that there are four or five of them which is the main channel for most of the uh, people. So we're still watching it. And uh, if we're just making the result of that, you need to really think about the intersection of the audience and cross, uh, we call it cross-platform media planning. Yeah? And the problem is that we don't have a lot of data for that. So it's still like an intuitive way or consulting way if we say it with our agency. So we have to consult our clients. Uh, think about more cross uh, media platform. If you go to some uh, channel, ask them about every, every uh, channel, media channel that they have. And uh, going uh, somehow logically to the clients, it is divided in two parts, and Marion liked that a lot. Uh, we, we, divide, we really divide it like that, so we work with the international clients and local clients. That is, and it's two different stories. And if we speak about integrated communications measurement and integrated commu communication marketing, that will be for international clients. They will be a responsible person just for that field. But if you go to the local company, probably you won't find such a person. It won't be. It will be really different uh, departments for marketing, for PR, and for advertising. So all the cases that we have for integrated communications measurement will be for international companies and not for the local ones. And um, when uh, we speak about the measurement and uh, what's the position of the agencies, because it's really important, it's, this trend is really coming from the agencies but not from the clients. So all the agencies, and it's really a very high competition between them for PR, advertising, communication, they're competing for this new trend setting of integrated communications marketing and integrated communications measurement. So uh, it is the same, uh, I think it's, uh, it's all the way around all over the world that is changing the PR industry, the communication industry. But I like these stories when we have, for example, in a tender, a creative agency and a PR agency. Because for sometimes it's even creative because uh, the client is searching for a new creative um, uh, attitude, a yeah, new creative aspect. So, this is a good news for all of us. Uh, if you want to go to Russia and if you're interested in the market, yes, because it's uh, good that the agencies are the trendsetters. So it's pretty easy to uh, position as a consultant. And uh, I would like uh, uh, to go for teamwork and before that to uh, tell you a little bit about our case study. It was, I remember about that when I was here and it's interesting because we are in Northern Europe and there was a Norwegian seafood we were making first, our first step to integrated communications measurement. And they were making a di digital campaign which was called uh, uh, 100 Days with uh, Norwegian Sal Salmon. So the people, there were only two, uh, 10 uh, bloggers who were, so they were, on li uh, they were on those blog platforms I already said to you, so it was livejournal.com and blogmail.ru. So they were posting two or three times per week some posts about salmon, how they cook it, how they like it, how they buy it. And there were only 10 of them. And it was about six years ago. I was thinking, come on, nobody will, will mention it, will notice it. The internet penetration is low. Imagine this woman and their target audience were women. Uh, women. I can imagine this woman at the same time reading the blog 
and buying this fish at the market. And uh, we decided, we were making the reputation audits for, the, for that uh, company and every year. So uh, we were making consumer uh, reports, a consumer service for them, opinion, opinion service. And I decided, let's just include one question into the survey. One question, do they, do they notice that activity or not? And half of them notice it. Half of them, really. I, I couldn't even imagine at that time. And next year, it was like a, it, it became a tradition, adding some new questions to the service. And we, next year, we added the question about sponsorship uh, on television program. Also, didn't realize that it would be so popular. Again, they were targeting the audience so good, so they were very effective. And it was our first steps for integrated communications measurement that we had. And I would like to end with this uh, very famous Russian fairy tale, and we still read it to our children, and it's about teamwork. So the idea is that the, it was a tonip, and it was growing, 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 and it's become very big. So there was the first grandfather, Dedushka, who was trying to, to pull it out. He can't, get, he can't do it, so he asked grandmother to help. Then they asking granddaughter to help, so they asking everyone to help. So finally they did it. So that's my uh, association with the uh, teamwork that we need to go for integrated communications measurement. So the, that's what we have at least at our market. It's really very difficult to find a professional with, I don't know, 10 years of experience of integrating uh, measurement especially, integrated communications measurement. So we are combining the specialists and it's really a question of a teamwork of their understanding. For example, in our company, uh, three years ago, we decided that a head of analysis department won't be a person from PR or media, it will be a person from market research. Yeah, the person who knows how to make all the service and then he will combine it with the, all the media measurement that we have. So, and another, uh, another idea that we are also facing and also these are the market is the partnership with different other agencies because we do not have all the data that we need. And really the partnership just to ask for the data and then you combine it is much easier and it's better for the client because he needs the answer today, not tomorrow. So he's not going to wait when we are able to do it ourselves. So that's all for, for today uh, and uh, for me. And I wish everyone a really good journey with the integrated communications measurement and to win the game as we have it, winning the game. This thesis of today's, uh, this uh, two, uh, two days uh, summit. So thank you very, very much. Good morning. My name is Michelle Peterson Murray, and I lead Beef is What's for Dinner. The National Cattlemen's Beef Association is the chief contractor for the Beef Checkoff Program. And I'm going to talk to you about our journey through integrated communications and what it meant for us and what it meant for measurement. I want to tell you first off, though, that I am a victim of being a, just a PR specialist. I started out in PR as a media relations manager, and I moved my way through my career. And um, I was doing key message development and pitching and creating immersion experiences. And then I got promoted into a role where I was leading an advertising agency, Leo Burnett, through a multi-million dollar advertising campaign. And they looked at me as the PR girl, right? The reality is I didn't build credibility unless I brought data and insights to the table. And through that process, what I discovered is that we were watching our marketing communications programming work happen on one side of the world and our PR program discipline happening on another side of the world. Both extremely effective and good at what they do, but combined could be doing so much more. So two years ago, we merged those practices together to create integrated communications for the beef checkoff. We represent America's farmers and ranchers. And our goal in that really was to think big for beef. It's truly our mantra. It's everything that we do and what we believe in. And part of why we felt that was so critical is that we knew the combined practice power was tremendous. Our advertising campaign had 86% awareness among, among Americans. And combined with that creative approach that PR brought, we could bring something very new to the table. I have to tell you that being here um, the same week that Don Bartholomew has passed, along with another producer leader who was very close to all of us in the cattle industry, whose focus was really on measurement and data, is truly powerful for me and for our team. 
Because if it weren't for that focus and that drive and that passion for measurement, I really don't think we would have realized the critical nature of us coming together as two practice areas. And so I really dedicate a lot of what we're sharing here today to Don and also to Richard Gephardt. So when we built our communications practice and really thought about how we integrated our approach, we couldn't look at it from an advertising PR model. We had to start thinking about it differently. And so what we did is thought through the core emphasis of our communications programming, and that really being about creating valued content, shareable content that works and sticks, and building upon that to create influencer advocacy programs. So taking that storytelling moment and bringing it forward to influencers. In our case, that's health professionals, bloggers, retailers, food service operators, and really taking that information and putting it in their hands, whether it's immersion experiences, educational briefings, or conferences, and, and attending those and really making the movement that makes change. And then ensuring visibility through that. And that's how we take that string that begins with content and great fact sheets and infographics or nice visuals on Facebook and pulls it through to a paid media model. So that peso model is filled in throughout all pieces of this. And our core emphasis throughout this whole process is to make sure that we don't think anymore or call ourselves PR practitioners or advertising practitioners. We are integrated communications practitioners. And I have to tell you that when we built this model and shared it with our team and then with our agency partners. Most of our agency partners were surprised by it and they weren't ready to provide us with the counsel and the support system that we needed for this. In the course of the last year, we've determined that the boundaries that we're setting are pushing the limits of what our practices and our agencies currently offer. And so I ask you as a client side to really think about what your client has going on in their minds and their hearts because they're before sometimes where you're at. And so listening is really critical and asking them where their biggest tension points are. Sometimes those organizational tension points will drive this kind of change before some of the external insights that you're bringing to the table will. So what I've determined really through this process in leading an integrated communications team is that agility is the key to winning that game. It's the key to understanding those insights and being able to make movement quickly. It's the key to real-time data, understanding, and impressions. Um, and what, one example of that is taking a piece of information that we might get from our media monitoring tools or our online tools and being able to act quickly on it. Um, and what we have really established as a team is that we have to be obsessed with our consumer. We have to be so centered on their needs, interests, and concerns that we're able to move quickly with them because they're the ones that are driving our programs. We're not driving the programs. And so that's a big shift to go from a brand-centric model to a consumer-centric model. When we began our measurement journey, I think this was the kind of thing that appealed to us, right? Having a dashboard. We wanted an output machine that we could send to our senior leadership team, to our producer leaders, and say, Look at what we're doing. This is how effective we are, right? But I think through the course of our measurement journey, what we discovered is that it's more than this dashboard. It's being able to make real-time programmatic decisions that allow us to be smarter about our programs and to really truly make a difference. And um, that became very critical from the standpoint of data quality. And in particular, making sure that the kinds of information that are put into a chart have true meaning. Um, as well as making sure that we have the kind of ability to translate that data into programmatic choices. Um, and I think that's one of our biggest struggles currently, is being able to keep up with the big mound of data that we have. Um, I work very closely with our market research folks, and I think that's the next level of integration for us, quite frankly, is being able to bring insights into the communications practice and having them in lockstep. And I will tell you that when we first started this journey and I built this team together, I was sitting with about two and a half, um, two and a half uh, stacks of market research data. And there was just no way that as a communications professional, I was able to sift through that and determine what those insights were. Our market research team had tremendous value, but yet it wasn't pulling through and giving us the kind of insights that we need. So even if you have feet of data or depth of data, 
you've got to be able to pull it out and show that what you can do with that communications information. So dashboards are just one part of the equation. Really using that insight and bring it forward to build strategy is where um, the pinnacle is. And I, I wanted to share this slide with you because I feel like one of the things that we learn um, as a cattle industry is that while technology is constantly changing, go back to your core. And our cattle producers do a really nice job listening to signals. Each and every day they listen to signals in the land, in the air, in the quality, uh, and of course of their cattle. And the reality is if you're not paying attention to those signals, you're not doing what's right for your business. And that's truly what we're doing here with measurement, is being able to think about how you connect up with those signals. And sometimes they're really subtle signals and others are really driving you forward and making changes. Um, so in my journey as a victim of just being a PR specialist and recognizing that I need to integrate in order to be successful, I've spent a lot of time thinking about CMOs. And in the course of the last year, it's really interesting to see what's going on with that conversation because CMOs and chief um, communications officers are now becoming blended in their, in their role and in their value. And I think it's really helpful for us to think about not just what they're asking for us to bring, but what we can bring to them and what we need from them. Um, IBM conducts a CMO survey every year and they shared that about 50% of CMOs are still trying to understand how to prove ROI value out of their measurement instruments. And about 53% of CMOs say that they're using their marketing analytics some of the time. So we're really struggling with that ability to get insight. So anything that you can do to help us understand how we get to insights in real time is really critical for us as clients. And I wanted to share an example of how we view some of our marketing analytics. And I mentioned that those heaps and mounds of market research that we have in front of us, in addition to our other social media listening tools. Um, and part of what really became a discovery for us was realizing that as an industry, we needed to get really segmented and precise about our targeting mechanisms. And so um, this is a particular data point that helped drive us toward that change. Um, we found that older millennial parents were preferring chicken for their children about 74% of the time. And ultimately what that told us was that we needed to start making some major shifts in what we were doing program programmatically. And that allowed us to drive all of our efforts toward that direct target and to really start making a change and making a difference. And if I leave you with one comment, it's all about that. There's a lot related to measurement, right? We've talked about reach and engagement tools. We've talked about the PESO model. We're exploring what we could do with content search analysis. There's a number of different ways that we can mine data today. But the reality is there's one big thing for each of us. And the more that we center our focus on that one big thing, it allows us to integrate. It allows us to walk across the hallway to that marketing side, to that market research side, and to bring cohesion and to bring better integration for our programs and for our businesses. Um, so I'd like to share a little clip with you that I think illustrates that pretty well. Cowboy leads a different kind of life when there were cowboys. They're a dying breed. Still means something to me, though. A couple of days, we'll move this herd across the river, driving through the valley. Oh, <laughs> there's nothing like bringing in a herd. See, now that's great. Your life makes sense to you. <laughs> What's so funny? You city folk, you worry about a lot. <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying. Uh, how old are you? 38. 39. Yeah. You all come up here about the same age, same problems. Spend about 50 weeks a year getting knots in your rope, and then, and then you think two weeks up here will time for you. None of you get it. Do you know what the secret of life is? No, what? This. Your finger? One thing. Just one thing. You stick to that and everything else don't mean. That's great, but what's the one thing? That's what you gotta figure out.
So whether it is sales, whether it's preference, whether it's driving a consumer to change, think about that one thing. We can get lost in details, and the reality is we've got to be able to make a difference for that one moment. It's whether it's in life or in measurement, make sure you have your center focus on that one thing. Thank you. That was a great presentation. That's hard to follow, especially when I don't have any slides. <laughs> um, so as uh, Marion mentioned, uh, my name's Heather Mitchell, and I head up uh, global PR and social media for the hair care category at Unilever. So we're going to go from talking about a couple, a little bit of a different, uh, different uh, avenue than, than cattle. But um, first, thank you to Marion and Barry for including me in this panel today, and uh, to Adam yesterday for uh, pinch hitting for me, uh, given that I did have some travel woes. I, uh, it took me all all, I was doing the math. Uh, door to door, it took me 20 hours to get here. So I really, really want to be here. <laughs> so um, anyway, if you'll uh, give me um, a little flexibility and uh, appreciate that because I do not have slides. I do have some notes. Uh, just to talk to you a little bit about what measurement means for us at Unilever in, in my, excuse me, in my role and uh, what I've been doing of, over the past few years um, in this role. So my role is very actually quite unique. Um, I'm the only globally dedicated brand PR and social media person at the organization. Uh, we have a lot of um, corporate and internal comms people and a lot of uh, a handful of brand PR people in the local markets. And for the most part, uh, it does obviously the activation happens at the local market. But where I came into the role about almost four years ago, uh, I've been with Unilever eight and a half years and did the role in the U.S., which really helped uh, you know, set the stage for obviously understanding uh, the category and understanding um, the opportunities at hand, but then taking those learnings and bringing them to the global role. And again, it was the first of its kind, the first role of its kind. Um, but what I really did um, in bringing a lot of the learnings and the teams and the people with me, uh, one of the first things I did was realize that you know, at the global level, we were really working in silos. So if you really truly think about integrated uh, marketing, you know, at the at the local level, we had all of our agency partners sitting around a table together. So each brand had what we called an IAT, integrated agency team, dedicated to, you know, all right, whatever the new product was for the year, we would all ideate around it, and then, or excuse me, the agencies would ideate around it and then present to us as the integrated marketing and PR team, uh, you know, one, one, one thing, one idea, and how it would live within all of the channels. And what I realized at the global level is that we weren't doing that. They were completely working in silos. So that was one of my first orders of business was let's create a global IAT model and make sure that we're thinking about things in an integrated fashion, but also measuring it in that way as well. Um, so like Michelle, I am a PR person at heart uh, and, and grew my career. Uh, before Unilever, I was at Gatorade. Before that, I was at Jim Beam. Uh, and before that, I was an agency side. And I think that um, what I've really realized is this evolution of PR and social media and the digital space uh, over the past uh, handful of years is really that the more we think like traditional marketers and traditional advertising people, the better our results will be. And so I've really uh, encouraged my uh, my agency teams and my brand teams to think through. You know, obviously, Donna, the you know, we don't care about impressions anymore necessarily. It's all to me. It's about yes. It, did, it, did it reach the consumer, but did it reach them in the right place? Did it have the right quality of message? And also, how are we all working together as an integrated team to think through what, what is the, per, you know, thinking about uh, did, it, did it make an impact on the consumer's perception of the brand? Did it make them want to go buy our product? Uh, did it affect their purchase intent? Did it make them think about our brand in a more favorable way? So I'll tell you a few examples of how we've done that. Uh, Adam took you through a little bit yesterday, which I'll speak to as well. But, um, one example is a little bit more of a traditional, a little bit prior to this digital evolution. Uh, and that was uh, when I worked on the Axe brand in the US. And if any of you are familiar with the Axe brand, it's obviously a very, very big, successful brand across the world. Uh, but in the US, we had a bit of a perception problem. And we were working you know, very, very integrated in a, in a very um, you know, holistic marketing way uh, for the brand. But um, you know, in this journey of trying to change perception of the brand, we actually had a, um, a piece in GQ for the first time. And we, of course, thought that was amazing. You know, like We are a mass brand, and we are in this, this you know, high-end publication with all these high-end brands. But you know what? 
to me, I said, all right, we think that's great, but did it actually make a difference in consumer perception? And what, what does our consumer think? So the way that we measure that um, were a few different ways. Um, first, we had something at the time called Communispace. I don't know if anybody is familiar with that, but it was a living, breathing uh, focus group that we had access to of about 100 consumers um, that we basically, they changed out, I think, once a month. The only caveat with it is that they were um, they were users already, so it didn't help change perception of non-users necessarily, but it helped inform us in terms of what did they think about the brand, and, and we were able to test things out with them. You know, did, what do you think of this new ad before we went live? What do you think of um, this new product? You know, and and live them, use them as a living, breathing focus group for, for measurement purposes. Um, so anyway, for this example, we did give them, you know, here, what do you think of this this article, and ask them a lot of a, a lot of questions about did it change your your thought your thoughts about the brand? Um, does it make you want to go buy it? Do you think that it's cool? You know, the, the very the normal brand, brand attributes that we would look at when we look at advertising as well. So really taking the learnings from the various marketing disciplines and applying it to all of them, um, and making sure that we're not working in those silos. Um, the other thing that we did is we did do a bigger study um, of a thousand consumers with our re our um, my PR agency at the time was Edelman, and they had a research arm that we leveraged to do some actual research to, again, dig deeper into what do you think about the brand overall? What do you think about this? Um, you know, how, what do you, what do you, um, how are you learning about the brand, whether it's PR, marketing, advertising, all of these different things, to thinking about it holistically and understanding that. Um, and the second example, of course, is the, the program that Adam shared with you yesterday, which is All Things Hair. Um, this is a program I'm super, super proud of, and I, I wish I could have uh, chatted with you guys about it yesterday, but if anybody has additional questions about it, I won't totally repeat uh, all the things that he shared, but um, this, this project completely came from data insights and, and really thinking about you know, the con and putting the consumer first. Um, the reason that it is so successful is because it's not actually about product, it's about people. And the way that we make it about people is completely through data. So the partners that we've worked with on this are, um, it, truth be told, it, it actually was a project that came out of the Google Academy. So we obviously are a big partner with Google and we spend a lot of money with them, which means we have great access to them and to their analytics team, uh, which is a huge benefit. I know not everyone has that. Uh, that um, that opportunity, but um, our teams once a year go and do some brainstorming with, with the Google team, and this idea of all things hair came very much from that, and the idea that there were 11 billion searches a year for how-to videos in hair care, but no one was owning it, and no one was taking advantage of it. So the idea came from that, and quickly when they realized the way that they wanted to leverage this opportunity through, through bloggers telling our story for us, then they immediately involved me, which you know I, was, I can't take any credit for the idea, but um, I was thrilled to be a part of it. And basically, you know, the way that we are looking at you know, what the search terms are and thinking about data from that perspective, but not only that, but then it's a living, breathing platform. You know, it, it, it's something that we can take advantage of every single day from a data and insights perspective to inform our teams um, you know, what consumers are thinking, what, they're, what they want, what they're looking for, what their concerns are, um, you know, to maybe even inform uh, new product development, but also thinking about how we can um, evolve the platform every day to um, answer the search queries that consumers have and, and meet their needs, not only from, you know, content, which of course is what the platform is all about, but also thinking about how can we inform and leverage it as a data opportunity for, for the rest of the teams as well. Um, the partners that we work with on that, again, I think um, this is where, as a traditional PR person, I think through, right, how can we think about things from an integrated perspective and not just, um, you know, thinking about the old school way that we used to look at measurement. Uh, and that is, you know, obviously we work with Google very closely, but, you know, Truth be told, of course, Google has a vested interest in our, you know, wanting to, you know, they share us all of their information, which of course is super important. But, you know, my from my perspective, I want third parties to tell us how the platform is doing as well, because obviously Google has a vested interest in telling us that it's doing really well because they want us to spend more money. <laughs> um, so we obviously, as an organization, we work with Miller Brown and doing a lot of data with with uh, a lot of research with them to understand. Um, and Adam shared with you some of this yesterday, but um, we've been able to look. Uh, through our partners at Miller Brown and then our partners uh, called Mavens, as well as the Weber Shamwick research team, to look at how this is impacting consumers. Um, so we know that it's th consumers are more three times more likely to buy the products featured in All Things Hair 
uh, and then three times more, it's, they find it three times more appealing than traditional advertising and four times more enjoyable than traditional advertising. So that I think is quite powerful too. And it allows us to not only justify that the, the investment makes sense, but you know, it reinforces how much it is uh, taking, taking information and taking branded content and making it much more authentic and relevant and relatable to the consumer because it's from certainly uh, these experts' point of view. It's not an ad where it's you know Unilever saying you know my product is the best product, go use it. It's experts telling them you know telling consumers, hey, look, I've used it on my hair. This is the style that I did, and this is what you what product you can use to get that look. Um, so again, you know, I really I really um, encourage all my agency teams to to think about their teams. Not just from t traditional, you know, journalist or PR backgrounds, but also traditional, you know, ad planners. I know a lot of my agencies, you know, Weber Shamrock is also doing this, you know, hiring ad planners to think through how can we think things a little, think about things a little differently. And I know also, you know, they're recruiting PhDs as well to be thinking about analytics and really, really thinking about things uh, the way that my my internal CMI research teams would, my marketing teams, uh, are all of our uh, analysis. Um, so I think, you know. That one other, the third example that I would share with you is, is um, something that's not uh, necessarily completely groundbreaking, and hopefully some of you have done things like this as well. Uh, but the idea of a command center, and you know, if, if anybody here followed the Super Bowl a couple of years ago, you're very familiar with the Oreo tweet uh, that obviously was generated out of a command center type of mission control setup, and. I think it's a really great way to really think about integrated communications and really leverage an opportunity to tell you what's happening and what put your finger on the pulse of what the consumer is doing and thinking right right away in real time. Um, so what I've done with that is uh, one of my brands, Tresemme, sponsors uh, New York Fashion Week. And Tony and Guy is another brand of mine who sponsors London Fashion Week. So these are key times a year in, in uh, September and February where the activation is happening and we are a part of it. We have have our hair products backstage, and we're you know engaging with you know we're, we're putting the um, hairstyles out on the runway with our product. So we're taking editors and bloggers backstage to show them that. But then there's this whole other world happening, in, obviously, in social media of consumers taking all this information right away and tweeting about it, posting about it, Instagramming about it. And there's all these conversations happening right away uh, that we have an opportunity to be a part of. So these command centers, you know, if I had a, that, that's the one slide I would show if I, if I could have uh, grabbed it this morning. If you think about, you know, if you take a room uh, and, um, I'll, you know, put about 10 screens and it's literally real time data of like, you know, where, it's ha where the conversation is happening in the world, uh, what consumers are saying about it, what the key words are, what the key themes. I mean, hope, I'm sure a lot of you have done this, uh, but it's just, it's, you know, it's a dashboard that, that you can have that just gives you all of the information at your fingertips to be able to act on it, not just thinking about it from an impact, input so that you know what's happening, but actually allowing you to act on it right away to make a difference. And we've been able to use that data to um, show us uh, one of the tweets that we did uh, September, maybe in February, two seasons ago in New York. We, we saw um, consumers were really interested in this particular uh, hairstyle. And, and indulge me, if you will, men, for a minute. But it was basically, ladies, you might understand this. It was like a French braid going off the back of your hair into a big top knot. Something that hadn't really been done. It sounds kind of silly, but it was something that we saw consumers really getting excited about. So we actually created that hairstyle with my products and with our celebrity stylists that we use and tweeted it out. And it was the most shared uh, piece of content in social media for all of New York Fashion Week. And that's, that's pretty huge. And we are able to do that because we we're watching and listening um, every, every minute of the, the seven days of Fashion Week. So um, those are the three examples I would share. And hopefully that did it justice without any visuals. Um, so I think the last thing I would wrap up with before we get to the Q&A is uh, one of the, uh, the, the two things that I think that we, the way we think about things from an integrated perspective for measurement is you know, the All Things Hair project, I think the reason we see it as such a success is, again, because we put people, not products, uh, at the heart of it. And by that, we really mean you know, be able to be able to do that, we, we put data in, at the heart of it. And our CMO actually was quoted recently saying, and I think this might be one of the slides that Adam shared, but you know, we talk about big data, but really it's big insights. And again, if you're not going to do anything with the data, it's, it's not going to it's not going to make make an impact on your business. So that's where I would encourage us to think through, you know, how how the, the data can be used to measure to not only know that we are successful, but to inform us for future opportunities as well. Thanks.
So thank you very much to all of my panellists. Great discussion. We've got just a few, minute for, few minutes for questions because Barry has threatened me if I run over time, of course, but he's not in the room, so we could just get away with it for a couple of minutes more. And Johanna and Caroline have the microphones. Any questions, and please let me know if there's a specific member of the panel you'd like to ask your question to or people you'd like to answer it as well. Right, right here in the centre. Thank you, Johanna. Thanks. Letty in black here. Hello, it's Karen Pritchard from Ubiquity. Um, I'm quite interested to know if any of you on the panel are actually effectively using your um, advertising insights and combining that with your corporate communications insight. Mm -hmm. yeah, for, um, yeah, for us, they're one. They're not seen as two separate, and um, that's been a new stretch goal for us to think about how we integrate those insights and we don't just look at it from the angle of the discipline and more around the target audience. And so our key targets, older millennial parents, parenting bloggers, food and health involved um, bloggers, as well as retail and food service operators, those are where we build our insights from. And so when we go through our planning process, we think about those needs. Um, for each audience and um, so much to what we are doing too is all about putting this product in their hands and a lot of times those insights are the things that drive us not necessarily what one advertising side or one PR side will share with us it's really listening to the market research and diving into what is at the heart of our consumer and connecting with them in that way so um, it's driven, I think, a new practice um, format for our insights because we're no longer looking at those silos as much as we are pulling it all together in one. Okay, so I asked because I couldn't see on the scorecard anything to do with the paid advertising. Yeah. So that was well. Yeah, and actually it's really interesting because that dashboard began as a PR tool, as a PR dashboard. And I think what we discovered along this journey is that we couldn't think about just that one thing. We had to kind of blow it out and really think about that peso model throughout all of it. Um, but truly where I think we are headed is to think about content generation, influencer advocacy, and generating visibility through all those. And so much of our brand positioning now is actually influencer spotlighting and putting that moment um, in touch with the consumer and tying it all together. Thank you. Any other questions? Up the backy, thanks, Johanna. Hi, I'm Suzanne from Adobe Systems. Michelle, I also have a question about the dashboard. You mentioned that it's not just about getting the insights for the sake of insights, but it's about making programmatic mm -hmm. uh, choices mm -hmm. and real-time <laughs> decisions um, based on those insights. Could you give us an example mm -hmm. of, of that? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. So um, similar to some of the social media um, listening that was shared, for instance, when we started our journey, we actually took our advertising model that had been printed magazine um, focused with some radio and moved it all to digital. We were able to understand a lot more through search, for instance, on traffic patterns of interest. And um, for consumers, we found that St. Patty's Day, for example, was a major area of emphasis and curiosity. A lot of folks don't know what to cook or how to cook um, that corned beef item for St. Patrick's Day, so they're looking for those solutions. So we were able to capture that and really connect in the right way. We we're also working with our state partners to identify that a uh, consumer, an older millennial consumer in Northern California is looking for a different kind of meal option versus an older millennial consumer in the New York market. So we were able to pull out regional data to start to forecast and build regional campaign programs based on those needs. Uh, for instance, some consumers want to know more about the production practice. And so we were able to tap into search to answer just those questions without overwhelming the consumer with so many, so many points of information about our product. Um, so those are just two examples of how we started to get more to insights tr um, driven focus. We also look at media coverage, for example, um, and other elements of what our influencers are talking about on their blogs to identify what's the right kind of storytelling moment that we have at that right moment. 
Thank you very much. We need to wrap it up there. Barry indeed did find me, unless that was a vision of Barry at the back doing this to me. Um, but I'd say thank you for coming along for your questions. Um, for those of you who went to my workshop last year, I hope I have redeemed myself through videos that not in, did not involve orgasm on stage or sex. I left that to Ben yesterday. It was a very clean panel. Please spread the word. I might get it allowed back next year without having to pre-screen my videos. <laughs> But thank you very much to the panel for joining us. Appreciate all your experience. Thank you.